As you face the river, you are facing Florida to the south. The west will be on your right and the east on your left. The St. Mary's River begins its tranquil 130-mile meandering journey to the Atlantic amidst the bald cypress and tupelo trees of the Okefenokee Swamp, a mere 40 miles away from St. Mary's as the crow flies. As early as colonial times, St. Mary's was a busy port. The local plantations shipped their crops of sugar cane, rice, indigo, and cotton to Europe. The abundance of longleaf yellow pine provided ship's masts for the ships of the Royal Navy. The diverse plant life caught the attention of noted botanists, William Bartram and William Baldwin, who made expeditions in the area. The St. Mary's River is classified as a blackwater river because of the high quantity of tannins present. This quality made its water highly prized by seafarers who would travel far upriver to fill casks with fresh water for their ocean voyages. The tranquil St. Mary's has also known turbulent times. Tensions between Georgia and Florida had existed as far back as colonial days. During the American Revolution, bloody guerrilla warfare was waged by Florida Tories against the Patriots in Georgia. After the American Revolution, Florida reverted to Spanish control. Problems still existed. This bustling port town was the southernmost port on the U.S. Atlantic coast and a flashpoint between the U.S. and Spain. Florida was a Spanish possession. On March 17, 1812, Georgians sought to solve the Florida problem. The incident became known as the Florida Patriots War. Declaring Spanish East Florida was an open rebellion and no longer a possession of Spain, the Florida Patriots seized possession of Fernandina on Amelia Island visible to the south. The United States sent the first U.S. Regiment of Riflemen, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Thomas A. Smith, to quell the rebellion and take possession of Florida. The first U.S. Regiment of Riflemen were based at Point Peter, less than two miles east of St. Mary's. A detachment of 47 U.S. Marines and two officers, Captain John Williams and Lieutenant Alexander Sevier, from their outpost on Cumberland Island, accompanied the first Regiment of Riflemen and conducted military operations. They quickly occupied Fort Mosa outside St. Augustine. Meanwhile, tensions between Great Britain and the U.S. were coming to a breaking point. On May 12th, U.S. Navy gunboat number 168, based at Point Peter, was fired upon by the British Royal Navy brig gun sloop HMS Sappho near Fernandina. A month later, on June 13th, Georgia militia troops from Savannah, the Republican Blues, and Savannah Volunteer Guards embarked gunboat number 168 and the Sloop Concord and sailed for the port of St. Mary's. The detachment continued on to Fernandina, where they outnumbered the Spanish 200 to 100. The Spanish quickly surrendered. After months of debate, on June 18th, the United States declared war on Great Britain. Concurrently, as the hostilities continued in Florida, the American expedition was beset by a series of unfortunate mishaps, and the Patriots' War was concluded. On 13 May, 1813, Captain Abraham Messias retired American colors flying over Amelia Island and returned to Point Peter. With its close proximity to the Caribbean, St. Mary's was a port of choice for American privateers to take the British ships or prizes they captured for adjudication. Some of the most famous privateers like the Sabine and Midas of Baltimore and the celebrated Saucy Jack of Charleston called at St. Mary's. Saucy Jack brought two prizes, the Eliza and the Three Sisters, into port. The next day, September 16, 1813, a powerful hurricane struck, sinking or grounding every ship in the harbor but two, the brig Three Sisters and the ship Wanskip. 
Among the sunken vessels were six U.S. Navy gunboats. On the modern-day Saffir Simpson scale, the hurricane was considered to be a Category 3, pushing a 20-foot high storm surge ahead of its dangerous northeast quadrant. Saucy Jack was run aground in the marsh, and U.S. Navy gunboat 168 was pushed seven miles from its anchorage off Fernandina to a marsh on Harriet's Bluff. The schooner Live Oak was blown on top of the wharf. While the schooners Hester and Katie Ann came ashore between Waterman's Bluff and Lowe's, the damage was staggering. Georgia, like the young American nation, was now engaged in a two-front war. Red Stick Creek Indians, allied to the British, raided Georgia's settlers and the string of tripwire forts along the length of Georgia's western frontier on the banks of the Flint River. Further west in Alabama, Georgia troops under Camden County resident General John Floyd fought alongside the troops of Old Hickory, General Andrew Jackson, in the campaign against the Red Stick Creeks and Choctaw. Floyd's most notable victories were at Otosi and Calabi. From St. Mary's to Savannah, along Georgia's 110-mile coastline, the might of the Royal Navy would be brought to bear. For the first year and a half of the war, things were relatively quiet on the coast. The British naval force in March 1814 consisted of a sloop, a brig, and a schooner. However, military and political realities often have unforeseen repercussions in distant quarters. One such place would be St. Mary's, Georgia. Napoleon's defeat at Leipzig in October 1813 and his subsequent abdication to Elba freed numerous British Royal Navy vessels for use in the American War. Accordingly, the situation on the East Coast would change dramatically. The vessels Majestic and Morgiana under Vice Admiral Alexander Cochrane appeared at the mouth of the St. Mary's. By August, this force would increase. Soon, the frigate HMS Lacedaemonian and several sloops, including Morgiana and HMS Dotterill, were seen on off the coast. At this time in the Chesapeake, British Rear Admiral George Coburn was conducting a fiery campaign. On 23 August, he ordered Washington, D.C. to be burned. Coburn then headed for Baltimore and Fort McHenry. In a battle during which the rocket's red glare and bombs bursting in air would inspire our national anthem, Coburn and his squadron were repulsed. The British retreated down the Chesapeake and returned to Bermuda to plan their next assault, Georgia's Cumberland Island, the Battery at Point Peter, and St. Mary's. On 18 December 1814, the 38-gun frigate HMS Rhoda was the first to anchor off Cumberland Island. Mr. Watt, let go of the anchor if you please! Over the next two weeks, two ships of the line, five frigates, 144, six mortar ships, Congreve rocket ships, schooners, transport ships, and 19 barges gathered off Cumberland Island for the impending invasion. At a point near the end of West St. Mary Street, a 1792 map indicates Fort Tammany was located overlooking the river. During the Indian Wars, it served as a jail for captured Indians. Later, it served as a jail for deserters from East Florida. During the War of 1812, there is evidence to suggest it mounted two cannons and was manned by townspeople from St. Mary's. Oak Grove Cemetery at the corner of Weed and Bartlett Street, established in 1788, is the final resting place of many notable citizens of Camden County. Military figures from all of America's wars, from the Revolutionary War to Vietnam, victims of yellow fever in 1808, and the hurricane of 1813 are buried here. Among the noteworthy is Major Archibald Clark, who died in 1848. Situated on the corner of Osborne and Congress, the Jackson Archibald Clark Besant House is the oldest house in St. Mary's, dating to 1801. Shortly after his duel with Alexander Hamilton, Aaron Burr sought the hospitality and counsel of Archibald Clark. Burr was a classmate of Clark at America's first law school, Connecticut's Litchfield Law School, founded by Tapping Reeve in 1773. Rhoda Clark, Major Clark's wife, was not pleased to have Burr under her roof. Burr was a controversial figure. 
After a feud with Hamilton that spanned decades, matters came to a head during the New York race for governor. When Burr's opponent, Morgan Lewis, won, Burr blamed Hamilton for his defeat. A comment made by Hamilton about Burr at a dinner party made its way into the newspaper. Aaron Burr, then the sitting vice president of the United States under Thomas Jefferson, challenged Alexander Hamilton, then the secretary of the treasury, to a duel. On the morning of 11 July 1804, they met in New Jersey on the dueling grounds known as the Heights of Weehawken, below the Palisades overlooking the Hudson River and New York City. The adversaries loaded their pistols stepped off the customary 10 paces. Hamilton second gave the word. General Hamilton, are you ready, sir? Colonel Burr, are you ready? Present! Each man cocked his weapon. Both men faced each other. Two shots were fired. Burr stood untouched. Hamilton fell to the ground. Lying on the ground mortally wounded, Hamilton confided to his second that he had never intended to fire at Burr. Burr stood trial for Hamilton's murder and was acquitted. Shortly after his visit to St. Mary's, Burr was captured in Alabama and charged with treason. In 1807, Burr was the principal figure in a scheme to convince several western states to secede and make him the president. The plan failed. Burr was tried and acquitted of treason, but his political career was over. On 14 January 1815, the day after the American battery at Point Peter had fallen to a combined amphibious assault, the British ascended the St. Mary's River. Captain Jackson and Captain Norse's boat division, carrying the Royal Marines, took possession of St. Mary's. There was no American resistance. Supporting the British landing were the mortar or bomb ships HMS Terror, HMS Devastation, and the Congreve rocket ship HMS Erebus. These ships were with Coburn during the burning of Washington, D.C., and the bombardment of Fort McHenry. The bombs of HMS Terror and HMS Devastation bursting in air, and the rocket's red glare of Congreve rockets from HMS Erebus inspired Francis Scott Key to write the poem, Star Spangled Banner, which would become the American anthem. The British took possession of all shipping in the harbor and plundered the town. Much of what was not stolen was destroyed. Among the ships of which the British took possession was the prize East Indiaman Countess of Harcourt, previously captured by the American privateer Sabine in the English Channel and brought to St. Mary's. Captain Robert Barry of HMS Dragon made his headquarters in the Archibald Clark House. Archibald Clark was one of St. Mary's most prominent men. A lawyer by training, he was appointed collector of the port of St. Mary's in 1807 by Thomas Jefferson and attained the rank of major in the Georgia militia. He owned successful sawmills some 30 miles away up the St. Mary's River on Spanish Creek near present-day Folkestone. The British immediately sought him out, finding him at home with his wife Rhoda and children. The British demanded Clark give them the customs duties which amounted to a rather large sum of money. Clark refused. Surmising a British assault was coming, Clark hid the funds far outside of town. The customs funds consisted of $12,000 in currency, $8,000 in bank bills, $100,000 in bonds, and $3,000 in private funds. After Clark's refusal, the British then threatened to burn his sawmill. When this had no effect on Clark, he was made prisoner and confined aboard the frigate HMS Primrose. A British officer then questioned Mrs. Clark, who told them nothing. As the officer prepared to leave, he noticed a carpet emblazoned with the British crown and remarked, I see you have the British crown. Mrs. Clark replied, Yes, but it is under our feet. Further interrogation of Major Clark brought no new information. The British then decided to carry out their threat. A British expedition consisting of eight launches, two pinnaces, and one gig carrying 189 Royal Marines departed the base on Cumberland Island. Leading the punitive expedition was the commander of HMS Primrose, Captain Charles G.R. Fillett. 
assisted by Captain David Ewan Bartholomew of HMS Erebus. The British boats were seen taking the back route through Bells River and back into the St. Mary's, thus avoiding the town of St. Mary's and heading upstream. Despite this precaution, the Georgia militia under Captain Mickler was aware of the British intention and deployed an ambush on the north bank of the St. Mary's River near Camp Pinckney. Colonel James Dell and a detachment of 30 East Florida Patriots deployed in ambush on the south bank and waited. Dell's men fired the first volley. Fire! As the British turned to address their attackers, they were hit by a volley from the 20 men of Captain Mickler's 3rd Georgia Militia, effectively catching the British in a deadly crossfire. Captain Phillott immediately ordered a retreat. The British incurred heavy casualties. The Florida Patriots and Georgia Militia were relentless in their torment of the Royal Marines. This was the final combat of the War of 1812, taking place on 22-23 February 1815. 10 days after the engagement at Fort Boyer, Alabama. The War of 1812 had officially ended six days prior to this riverine engagement. The Treaty of Ghent had been signed on 24 December 1814, ratified by the British Parliament and Prince Regent on 28 December 1814. Congress ratified the treaty on the 16th of February 1815. The following day, President Madison exchanged ratified copies with the British diplomat. Ultimately, the treaty was proclaimed to the nation on 18 February, 1815. Peace had come. General Winfield Scott was a guest of Archibald Clark while on leave from the Second Seminole War. Scott's military career spanned nearly six decades. His service included the War of 1812, the Black Hawk War, the Second Seminole War, the Cherokee Trail of Tears, South Carolina nullification, the War with Mexico, and the Civil War. General Scott earned the nickname Old Fuss and Feathers for his devotion to pomp and military protocol. In 1852, Scott made an unsuccessful bid for president as the Whig Party candidate. Although a native Virginian, he did not favor secession and had served as President Lincoln's general-in-chief. His anaconda plan of divide and conquer, although highly ridiculed at the time, proved to be the Union blueprint for victory. General Scott died in 1866 at West Point, New York. He is buried there. The General John Floyd Townhouse is located at 213 Osborne Street. John Floyd was born in Beaufort, South Carolina on 3 October 1769. Floyd's family moved to McIntosh County in 1795 and then to Camden County in 1800. By trade, John Floyd was a master builder. He built Bellevue, known as the Anchor House for his father, and later Floyd built Fairfield for his wife and family. During the War of 1812, Fairfield was raided by Royal Marines from HMS Whiting. General Floyd died on the 24th of June, 1839. He is buried in the Floyd Family Cemetery near his beloved Fairfield Plantation on Floyd's Neck. <laughs>